Pentecostal Church International. I'm Jonathan Moore, Director of Communications for the United Pentecostal Church, and I'm glad you've joined us for today's broadcast. We are especially grateful today to have Dr. David K. Bernard here with us in the studio. Dr. Bernard is the General Superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church International. He is the founding president of Urshan College and Urshan, Urshan Graduate School of Theology. He is the founding pastor of New Life Church in Austin, Texas. Dr. Bernard earned his undergraduate degree at Rice University, a law degree from the University of Texas, and both his master's and his doctorate from the University of South Africa. In addition, Dr. Bernard also is the author of 37 books on theology and church growth. Welcome, Dr. Bernard. Glad to be here. The United Pentecostal Church has been experiencing growth recently, and we'd like you to share with us a little bit of what's been happening. We have had growth. We've had great growth internationally. You know, we started in 1945 as a merger of two organizations. And at that time, I think we had 521 churches. Today, we have 42,000 churches worldwide, counting our preaching points and daughter works. Uh, and that's in 195 nations out of 210, as identified by the Population Reference Bureau. Plus, we're in 35 territories. So uh, there has been dramatic growth worldwide, explosive growth. Um, here in the U.S. and Canada, which are, is our home base, um, in recent years there hasn't been explosive growth, but there has been growth, and we're thankful for that. Those are fantastic numbers, especially when you look at them historically, what's happened over the last 75 years. But what's, what's driven this growth, particularly recently? Well, I think there are many factors, but the, uh, number one, we are a missionary organization. The, the very reason why we form, the number one reason, as stated in our Constitution, is the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church. So our focus is planting churches, growing churches, reaching unreached towns, cities, nations. Uh, and I think that, that missionary emphasis or that evangelistic emphasis more than any one single factor is the reason for our growth. Then of course, we have to say that we believe it's the Holy Spirit, that, that God himself uh, is the one who's pouring out his spirit upon all flesh and enabling the church to grow as he wills. Absolutely. Now, I also know that there's been a lot of planning that has been put into all of this, that this just hasn't happened by accident. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the planning that's gone on in the last decade? Yes, and that's really what I'd like to talk about today because I've said, first of all, God is the one who gives us growth, which is scripturally true. Uh, we plant, we water, it's God who gives the in increase, so all glory goes to God. Uh, and then we've said it's basically our mission. That's our driving focus. And I do believe that if you're going to grow, it has to be intentional. It has to be your mission. But those two are necessary, but there also has to be a strong element of strategic planning. Because while God gives the ability, um, He does not assume the responsibility for the work. It's still up to us. Um, just like planting a crop, we're totally dependent upon the life that's in the seed, which comes from God on the sunshine, on the rain. But God's not gonna grow the crop without us. We're the ones that have to uh, till the ground. We're the ones that have to plant the seed. You know, we're the ones that have to tend and harvest the crop. And so I do believe there's a big component of strategic growth that we have to think about it, plan it, make it our priority uh, with, with God's help through prayer and through discussion. We have to decide what steps should we take to facilitate growth? And then we have to make those steps. Uh, so just to give you an example, when I became general superintendent in 2010, my predecessor, Brother Haney, had appointed a committee to look at restructuring the UPCI. Now at that time we were in financial crisis, so the number one challenge was uh, what can we do to change things to help ourselves financially? Part of the financial struggle was internal. Part of it was a recession that hit the U.S. at that time. Uh, so anyway, the first year I became general superintendent, that committee reported, it was a committee of the general board, and they reported uh, 12 items that they recommended that we work on. Some of those were financial, but they did take the liberty to look more broadly. That was kind of an initial phase, but then as I became uh, uh, into the superintendency a, a few years, 
uh, we developed a senior leadership team, the division heads and other key leaders. So in 2013, we had our first senior leadership planning retreat where we took a couple days to focus on what, uh, what should the future look like and what should we do to get to that future. Um, and so what we did is a little exercise uh, where you look at the various factors that, um, that you need to, pl to plan ahead. And then we came up with five objectives that we felt were major objectives for the next few years. And we started trying to work to accomplish those objectives. So it was, it was quite a detailed uh, time of researching and study to see where we were, um, what were our strengths, what were we doing well, uh, what were our weaknesses, what did we need to improve, or, uh, or did we need to focus more on our strengths, um, and then what were our opportunities the next few years, um, then what were the threats, the things that if we didn't pay attention to could block our growth. Um, so that would be called SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T. Look at your strengths, look at your weaknesses, look at your opportunities, look at your threats, and from there come up with a plan of action. And what were the five objectives there, the objectives that you, you came away from? Well, the five objectives, we, we brainstormed as a group, and then we divided into, uh, once we identified those five objectives, we broke into committees, and the committees began to develop them more fully, and then we followed up over the next few years. So. Those five, first of all, we needed a new building. We felt like everything we were doing was constrained by our location. Uh, we had a good building, but it was getting close to 50 years old. It was out of date. It was a financial drain, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we didn't really have the space to grow. So the first thing was we need to come up with a practical strategy for a new building. Second, uh, we needed a restructure for growth. So not only the physical building, but the way we operated was been the same for about 50 years with, with some modifications. So there were some ministries that had outlived their usefulness. There were other ministries that needed to, to come into being. Uh, we needed to change the way we were doing things. We needed a new IT system. We needed uh, uh, building-wide policies that we didn't have. So restructuring for growth, that was the second thing. The third thing was collaboration and partnerships. Over the years, as with most organizations, we developed somewhat of a bureaucracy, silo mentality, turf protection. We are acting like seven or eight organizations within the same building rather than one organization. So we talked about how do we break down these barriers? How do we work together? How do we collaborate? How do we form partnerships that might cross what the traditional division or ministry structures were, but yet were needed to meet the challenges of the 21st century. So that was the third thing. Uh, the fourth thing was involving the next generation. How do we get younger people to buy in, uh, to feel like this is their organization? How do we get young people to enter the ministry and be trained and qualified? At, at all levels, how do we engage the next generation? And then fifth, which is our core, which will always be the same, is evangelism and discipleship. How can we be more effect effective in growing the church not only in the evangelism side, but in the discipleship side, which also involves retention. Because if you have tremendous growth, but then you lose 90% of your growth, right. then you're not really accomplishing much. So you have to evangelize, but you have to disciple. So that would result in net growth. So those were the five main objectives that we begin to work on. And six years later, can you give us an update on where we're at? Sure, uh, let me think about these. Um, in the new building, God blessed us amazingly. We do have a new building uh, and we're able to do it within our current budget. It's a miracle, uh, which I've told that story before, but we moved from an old building, which we sold for $4 million, um, into a new building that was built for $17 million, but through a miracle, we got it for $8 million. And also by saving, we saved so much money, probably, uh, Eighteen to twenty thousand dollars per month on maintenance, utilities, and so on. That was the difference uh, that we needed to self-finance the new building. So essentially, we moved into this new building with fifty percent more office space, with room for expansion indefinitely um, on our eight acres of land in in a business park, a very nice area conducive to our operations. We're able to do that without increasing our budget, without a capital campaign without asking for more money from any division, but using the same money we're already spending on our old building, uh, we 
are using it for our new building. So that was a major miracle. Absolutely. That was the first step. Structuring for growth, there are a number of ministries that we closed down or restructured. There are a number of ministries that were kind of on their own, which we brought under what we call church advancement under the general board, the executive board, were to give greater ownership to their constituencies, like Spanish evangelism ministries, multicultural ministries, for example. Then we created some new ministries, and we tried to do it without extensive overhead. So one example is the Family Ministries Council, where we're trying to meet the needs of the 21st century, but using our existing division. So four divisions partnered to create the Family Ministries Council. Didn't cost a lot of money, mm -hmm. but it's creating a lot of new resources. Uh, another way we've done is by forming new endorsed organizations. What I mean by that is people that have a certain interest, like apostolic educators, apostolic counselors, Occupational Chaplains of America, just to name a few. They create an organization with a structure. We endorse it. They report to us, but it doesn't create overhead at headquarters. Yet we have experts who are developing ministry in specialized areas. So that expands the total outreach of the UPCI with minimal expansion of bureaucracy and overhead. So we probably have a dozen ministries like that. Uh, including training programs that we've started over the years. So that's a part of the example of restructuring. Likewise, I've already talked about the collaboration partnerships. The Family Ministries Council is one example. The training, we're using Urshan College, Urshan Graduate School of Theology. Uh, we're using other Bible colleges to help meet the training needs of North American missions, global missions. Uh, we're beefing up training all across uh, our fellowship in every area. Uh, but trying to do it collaboratively in partnership. Um, and, and I'll just mention with the training, uh, new endeavors such as Ministry Central, which is a one stop for all kind of training from children's ministry to youth, to ministerial credentials, um, to church planting and church growth, you name it. You go to that one website, you've got all the training you need. Uh, and that's all divisions working together to produce content. So instead of each doing its own thing, we're partnering, working together. Um, and then involving the next generation, uh, we are doing things like a track for, for young ministers getting credentials. Uh, of course, the youth division, now North American Youth Ministries, has done a tremendous job of engaging uh, the next generation through P7 Bible Clubs, uh, through campus ministry, and of course, North American Youth Congress with a record attendance this year of almost 37,000. We're engaging uh, young people as never before, but we're trying to do practical tracks. So, so through these ministries, they're learning to, to evangelize. They're learning to share their testimony, teach Bible studies. Well, that means they're gonna be more conducive to feeling a call to preach and to want to start churches. Right. So we're not just trying to recruit people to get a license to preach or to start a church, we're trying to create a culture starting when they're teenagers where they're involved in the ministry of the church that will lead naturally into uh, adult ministry. And then, uh, then evangelism and discipleship, we'll talk about that later, but one of the most exciting things is the strategic growth initiative where every nation around the world and every district in the U.S. and Canada is developing its own strategic growth plan. How do, does our nation or our district grow the church? So uh, on each of these five areas, it's a work in progress. It'll probably always be a work in progress, but we've made significant um, strides in each of those areas. If you could touch just briefly, one of the things that you've stressed since you became general superintendent was that undergirding all, everything that we do, there has to be our apostolic identity. How does that play into all of this? Of course, that's the foundation, and uh, we can't neglect that. But the reason why we exist as United Pentecostal Church International is because of our, new, our unique message, uh, the message of the oneness of God, the Almighty God in Jesus Christ, the new birth experience of repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost with the initial sign of speaking in tongues, Pursuing a life of holiness, which is both inward and outward. It's both personal and social. Uh, and then, of course, we add to that the, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, worship, the soon coming of the Lord. But all of these things make us unique. And uh, if we don't emphasize these things, why should we even exist? But if we do emphasize these things, we believe there's power in the Word 
and in the spirit to accomplish what we need. So if we really want to grow, we're not just looking at adding numbers. There are a lot of churches or even, or even social groups that are effective at that. If that's our goal, we don't even need to exist. Um, but if we want to see people baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, with a transformed life in local churches, paying their tithes, seeking to live a holy life, seeking to, to make a difference in their community, um, seeking to reach lost souls, uh, seeking to support missions worldwide. If that's our goal, which it is, then it's essential that we emphasize our apostolic identity because that's the only way to accomplish our goal. So yes, in everything we do from our publications to our training, uh, we're trying to find new ways to communicate and reinforce uh, our basic apostolic identity and message. Anybody who knows you knows that not only is apostolic identity one of your passions, but education is one of your passions. And can you just tell us some of the developments that have happened with apostolic education in the last few years and bring us up to date on some of those things? Sure. Let me be clear. Um, you know, we are people of the Spirit, so we firmly believe God can use someone with very little education or very great education. The example I give, the Apostle Peter was a fisherman, one of the least educated people of his day, but no one was used greater than the Apostle Peter to preach the first message and to open the door to New Testament salvation. On the other hand, the Apostle Paul was one of the most highly educated men of his day, both uh, with uh, religious theology, uh, trained by Gamaliel, uh, but also in secular culture. As you read Acts 17, he had some course of study, whether self-taught or otherwise, where he could quote from memory from Greek philosophers and poets. So Paul would be one of the most highly educated men of his day uh, with an advanced degree in modern terms in theology as well as secular culture. And so God used him in unique ways. I mean, he was the one God used to preach to governors and kings according to tradition to the Emperor Nero himself. So I believe God uses people at every end of the spectrum. So I, don't, I do not believe education is a substitute for anointing or for spirituality, but you don't have to choose one or the other. As Brother Tenney used to say, God can use baptized brains. Mm -hmm. um, but so here's what I'm looking at. We are an international organization with a constituency of, of over 5 million. We should offer a full range of options. There will always be a, a room for people who are basically self-taught, but that should not be the only mechanism. You know, wh whether you're self-taught or not, every qualified minister of the gospel has to be trained in the Word of God, if nothing else. And then if you're going to be a pastor in the 21st century, there's so many other things you need to have an acquaintance with. And you can learn a lot of it by experience, but that doesn't have to be the only way you learn. So I, as a general superintendent, I want a full range of, uh, range of options. So someone who's largely self-taught, yet they can go through uh, Ministry Central. And they can, we have what, launch your ministry or the develop, ministry development curriculum even before you get local license. And then we have a track for local license, a track for general license, a track for ordination. So even if you have zero education anywhere else, except you know maybe a high school education would at least be desirable, you can still go through a track of apostolic training through Ministry Central and be fully qualified. Well, what if you want more training that's available than that? Well, in your local church, there are church-based programs such as Purpose Institute, which we, uh, we endorsed. Uh, and then we have our Bible colleges, which we endorse, as well as Urshan College, which is a Christian college with a little different model, and then Urshan Graduate School, which is our only seminary or graduate school. Well, all of those have distance learning options where you can learn at home. Or you can go to those colleges. And what I've tried to do is have a seamless whole. So let's say you start at Purpose Institute or one of the Bible colleges or Urshan College. Or let's say you start overseas with the Global Association of Theological Studies. And then for whatever reason, you need to go further. Maybe you want to earn a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. No matter where you start in the UPCI educational program, we want to plan where your credits can transfer and where you know up front, if I go to so many classes of Purpose Institute, how will that help me towards, uh, say, a bachelor's degree? Mm -hmm. uh, or if I go to an unaccredited school, but later I want to get an accredited degree, how can I go to the school of my choice, but then later have an option for an accredited degree? Or if I want a master's degree, which currently is, is only available through UGST. How can I, whether I go through a Bible college or whether I go to Urshan College or maybe a secular uh, accredited school, 
how can I then translate that into a master's degree? And even if you go to a Bible college that's not accredited, uh, is there a way to go to Urshan Graduate School and come out with an accredited master's degree? And the answer is yes, we've worked that out. So that's the idea is to have all these educational options, to have more of them, but to have them at the highest quality, suitable for every person, from the self-taught person to the person in the local church, to the person that's willing to go off to school, person that wants distance learning, want a bachelor's degree, want a master's degree, and then down the road, I'm sure UGST, they're already looking at uh, the possibility of doctoral programs. So I don't believe education is the answer for everything, but it is an important tool that the universal church needs to have in the 21st century. There have been some really exciting developments that have happened recently, for example, at Urshan. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Sure. Uh, well, of course, Urshan Graduate School of Theology was started in 2000, opened classes in 2001, got fully accredited 2010. So it's been, uh, for many years, our only fully accredited educational institution, uh, and it's on the graduate level, accredited master's degrees. Uh, also, federal financial aid is, is offered. So that has been our flagship. Now, we've had several other schools decide that their mission was to be accredited. I'm not saying every school has to do that. Mm -hmm. they, they, they may have a unique mission that they don't feel like accreditation is necessary. So I don't want to disparage any of our schools, but I'm happy to tell you that Christian Life College in Stockton, California recently got accredited. Uh, I've been told that Texas Bible College in Lufkin, Texas is also seeking accreditation. Urshan College, which was launched out of Urshan Graduate School, uh, they have candidacy. So they have one more step to go because in their region, it's a, a much longer process than in some other regions, but they've got their site visit for, scheduled for next year. But with candidacy, their credits are already recognized and they're able to, to be part of the federal financial aid. So actually we've got students for the first time um, that, that, that I've ever heard of for any of our institutions that they're, they've gotten Pell Grants, which are federal grants to go to Urshan College. So, so that's a miracle. And uh, you may have heard, but Urshan College, Urshan Graduate School just acquired a new campus uh, because of the growth. And they already have grown past what they could have accommodated on the campus they just left this summer because uh, their, their enrollment is something like 410 for wow. the combined institution, uh, which is really high historically for any of our schools. Although I, I believe in a few years, it'll be a thousand. So yes, exciting things are happening in the field of education across the UPCI. Definitely. Uh, all of this, of course, there's a financial side of it. The church does not move forward uh, solely on planning and, and the Holy Ghost. We, we certainly need finances, but can you tell us a little bit about that, what's happening there in the UPCI? Yes, uh, when I became superintendent, there were, there were a combination of unfavorable factors that it's just, it just happens, it's just life. Uh, but we'd had a small decline uh, in churches and ministers. We had some people leave us. We had an economic recession. We had a number of factors going against us. We had some old legacy ministries that we needed to find a way um, to transform or close down. And several of these were millions of dollars in debt. We had um, a number of ministries that were hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars in debt, which meant other ministries that had cash were effectively, we were borrowing their surplus to cover the deficits in others. Um, and uh, our publishing house, because of the drastic changes in publishing, uh, was losing money, had been losing money for 10 years. So we couldn't sustain that. Uh, historically, we'd use the publishing house profits to subsidize other ministries. So when the publishing house was losing money, not only that hurt our cash flow, and, but it also cut off a number of other ministries that now they were in deficit. So it was a ripple effect. And uh, just to give you kind of a, a, a bird's eye view, um, at, at one point we were down to um, $4 million in cash, which sounds like a lot of money until you realize at that time we were spending over a million dollars a week through world operations a lot of that for missionaries and so on. So if you, if you have less than $4 million cash, that means you can't pay for that month's operations. You're waiting for checks to come in the mail before you can pay your bills. Yeah. That's not a very good position to be in. So to make a long story short, we started cutting costs. We started reducing overhead, mostly through attrition. We were able to lay off a number of people. We were able to outsource 
our publishing so we could focus just on the content and let the experts do the printing. Uh, and that, that way we saved a lot of costs because otherwise we were having to invest millions of dollars into equipment that was changing every couple of years. So we couldn't afford to do that. We switched to a new computer program. Uh, we switched to a new headquarters, which has saved us money uh, in, in, in the sense of maintenance and utilities and, and able to, to reallocate that money towards a, a newer, nicer, bigger building. Uh, but, you know, ministry after ministry, we insisted that every ministry had to break even. They, and they also had to come up with a plan to retire the old deficits. So this year, for instance, I was just looking at the records that just came out as of June 30. You know, we self-financed the new building, we self-financed our new IT system, and then we have two old deficits account, accounts. Well, we have put nine, over $900,000 this past year towards retiring those old deficits. That's almost a million dollars. So while expanding all of our operations, we've saved enough money to start taking care of bills from many years ago and bills caused by our own expansion. And we're on a track to raise ministerial dues every five to seven years. Well, it's been 12 years since we've done that. Uh, and we still don't have a plan to do that because we've been able to cut costs in so many ways. Uh, so that's been a major effort. Uh, and not only cutting costs and streamlining, reducing overhead, uh, outsourcing, but also finding new sources of revenue. So for instance, we started an insurance company, which we buy life insurance for every one of our ministers. Somebody gets the commissions for that. Mm -hmm. Well, we create a brokerage where we get our own commissions back. Um, we started a loan fund uh, before our church was having to go outside uh, and pay interest to secular bankers. We can now raise money from investors, loan that money to our churches. They can get a better interest rate, or in many cases, they can get a loan, which was otherwise unattainable. Uh, we use that interest to cover the cost for our investors and cover the cost of operations. If there's any left over, we can now use that for ministry. So we're starting to generate um, through these various types of activities, which are ministry related, we're, we're really taking money that was already being spent, but it was going outside and circulating them back. So it's coming back to us, which we can repurpose for ministry. So there's a stream of hundreds of thousands of dollars every year, which is coming for ministry. So through that combination, again, to use a simple example, we now have probably something like a six months reserve of cash instead of less than one month. And while that may sound excessive, when you consider that with international, international operations, what if there's a major crisis where we have to bring 100 missionaries home? We mm -hmm. need cash on hand. Or in the case we bought the new building or we needed to buy a warehouse, we didn't have to go outside and borrow it. We could just borrow from ourselves. So having that cash gives us uh, a, the luxury of operating without fear or constraint, but also taking advantages of opportunities or even handling crises internally, uh, borrowing from ourselves as needed. So that, is, that has been transformational, being able, and that's a multi-year process of many, many people, many divisions, everybody working really hard. The publishing house is, is profitable. It generates uh, uh, hundreds of thousands every year, which of course, I mean, nobody uh, gets extra income from that. It's funnel back into new projects, into things like creating Ministry simple, Central, Discipleship Central, uh, working on a new comprehensive website, uh, music launching music ministry, which, which helps all of our churches. So this money is flowing back in to enable us to advance in ministry. And several of our divisions have had record offerings recently. Yes, in fact, every single one of our fundraising divisions has had record offerings this year from youth, to ladies, uh, last year North American Missions with Christmas for Christ, uh, Global Missions with their monthly partners and missions as well as their I Am Global, which is the one-time offering to help reduce travel in the U.S., deputational travel. Uh, we've gone from a year to a year and a half of travel f to a veteran missionary only having to travel six months. So these have been incredible. I mean, these are record offerings year after year for, in most cases, we're now talking about six and seven years in a row. Men's ministry, children's ministry, every single one of them. And you know, you wonder about that. I think there are two things. Uh, of course, we credit the favor of God, obviously. Sure. But by becoming good stewards 
and finding ways to save money and multiply money, and uh, that's creating greater confidence among our constituents, our, our givers. For instance, in order for headquarters to operate, at one time we were taking 4% of every offering, every missionary offering, every PIM to pay for headquarters. One of my goals is to get rid of that. So we were able to restructure so now we don't take anything. Of course, we still have to pay for, uh, the ministries have to pay for what they use, but we don't take a surcharge. Um, so we pay for accounting, we pay for floor space, but each ministry just pays its own cost. And that means every dollar that get, is given to these programs goes to those programs. It doesn't go to, to headquarters overhead. Uh, and so I think eliminating that 4% has encouraged people, well, now that I feel really confident my money's gonna be spent for what I really want it for, right. I'm, I'm ready to give more. And then I have to give credit to the grassroots. All of our ministries have worked really hard. And, and I would also say there's a spirit of unity where we see ourselves as one church, one organization with one mission. And when people are united like that, they participate. That's why we're seeing Youth Congress explode incredibly. And obviously that's due to the wonderful youth team that's worked very hard, but it's also due to this feeling of unity. This is our church. Everybody in our organization wants to make that a success. Right. Uh, and the same thing with our offerings. We have incredible teams that are raising these funds, but we also have this undergirding sense of unity this is my church. I want to give to missions. I want to give to children's ministry. I want to give to men's ministry because I want it to succeed. And, and these are our people. And, uh, you know, it's something you can't just create. But as you preach, as you teach, as you work hard, um, and as God blesses, there is a wonderful sense of unity. And one of my main objectives is we can have differences of opinions. We might have different policy ideas. That's all fine. We're a democracy. <laughs> We don't all think alike, but at the end of the day, we've got to preserve that unity. We are the United Pentecostal Church International. You mentioned that on the district level, they're participating by creating their own strategic growth initiatives, and you've, you've discussed a few of the success stories. Can you just share a couple of those with us? Yes, L let me backtrack. And uh, when I became general superintendent, just to kind of give you my background, I was raised in foreign missions. My wife and I started a home missions church in our home built it to say about a thousand constituents and we started 16 churches out of that church with, with currently about another thousand constituents. The, the churches continue to start more and some close down, others start, but there are probably about 20 churches in one way uh, they're out of that original church. And uh, I, was, I was elected as a presbyter, I think it was in 96, I served seven years. Uh, we grew from 30 churches and no daughter works and we implemented the daughter work concept. We grew to 53 churches and daughter works. So then I was asked to be the first superintendent of the new South Texas district. We started with 150 churches and 10 daughter works for a total of 160. And other people had done the daughter work concept before my time, including brother James Kilgore in Houston. But at that time, I think of those 10 daughter works, I think seven or eight were from our church. So we applied that and in seven years we grew to I think it was 242 churches and daughter works. So when I became general superintendent, I had this feeling, we can do this everywhere. Mm -hmm. I began teaching it, preaching it, talking about it, training the general board in what we had done in South Texas. And of course, other districts were also doing things. Um, but a couple of years ago was a turning point. The general board had asked me to form a strategic growth committee. That committee reported and there was such a move of God. This was the fall, September of 2017. And God spoke to us in the general board meeting through tongues and interpretation and said there's a divine shift. And then from that, uh, one of the members said, we need to believe God. You know, we have a constituency here in the U.S. and Canada. If you use statistics like the Catholic Church or the Baptist Church to compare everybody who affiliates with the church, we're probably talking about 750,000 constituents, even though you wouldn't have that many on a typical Sunday, but that's those who identify as United Pentecostal. And so he said from that, let's believe God for more than a million. Mm -hmm. And then there was another prophetic word, the time is now. And I've had, I had honorary board members that served on there 40 plus years. 
They said, we've never seen something like this in the general board setting. There wow. seemed to be just a prophetic utterance. So from that, the district superintendent said, we want each district to develop its own plan. This will not be a headquarters plan. It's not a top-down thing. It's not a requirement for the general superintendent. But the district superintendent said, this is what we need to do. I asked them, do you want to hold each other accountable? They said, yes. I said, well, let's create a committee of peers that the plans won't come to headquarters. The plans will come to you. You can advise. You can give information. Uh, and so we formed this committee, Strategic Growth Committee of Experienced Leaders. So what's happening, and it's taken a while to ramp up, but I think all but two or three districts have submitted their plans, and the, uh, the rest I'm sure will do so uh, in the next month or two. But they're coming up with a plan with four elements. First of all, how do we recruit and train ministers? We can't call people to preach, but we can create an environment where people feel the call, and then we can tell them, here's the steps you need to take to be qualified. First of all, so let's increase our number of ministers. Second, how can we plant new churches, preaching points, and daughter works? Where do we need more churches? Where are the unreached cities, unreached counties and provinces, uh, or, uh, or parishes, are underreached? Uh, where do you have maybe a, a, a city of a million with one church, or even a, a city of 100,000 with one church? Uh, where do you have large pockets of ethnicities, of language groups that are not being reached? So where do we need to plant churches? Third thing, how do we do a better job of retaining churches? Churches that are struggling, churches in decline. How can we come alongside to partner them? And then, how can we help existing churches to grow? If you have a church of 50, how can they go to 100? If they're at 100, how can they break the 100 barrier? So each district is coming up with a plan to address four elements, which may not be the same. It will vary depending on the needs of that district. And then that comes to the committee which gives advice and direction and helps with implementation. So we're in that process right now, and I really believe in the next few years we're going to see explosive growth. Right now, in the U.S. and Canada, we're seeing maybe 2% growth, uh, which is good. It's much better than zero or negative one, which we had some years ago. So this 10 years, our growth has been significantly better than the last 10, 10, the 10 years before that. But I think it needs to be 3, 4, 5%. At 7%, we would double every 10 years. So ultimately, I'd like to get to that point. Absolutely. But if I could get to 3 or 4%, and the good news, it's already happening. Uh, the Wisconsin district, from when it started this plan, has, has just about doubled. The South Texas district, same way, and actually out of that came the new South Central Texas District, which they're on a track of growth. Um, the Florida District planted 51 churches wow. in two years. Um, North Central Jersey, which are um, small and one of our most needy areas, planted eight churches in five years. So across the board, we're seeing testimonies, not just in one demographic or one part of the country, but in districts of all sizes all across the country, um, so it, the momentum is building, and I'm very excited about the future. Definitely, yes, it's very exciting reports. So can you just talk to that pastor or that church member who is watching this broadcast today? What can that person do to be involved in this? What steps can they take to help foster this environment of growth? Well, first of all, I would say that uh, become aware of all the resources that are available to you. Do some research. Go to ministrycentral.com, discipleshipcentral.com. Go to the pentecostalpublishing.com. Uh, go to the Family Ministries Council. Uh, and all these are linked from upci.org and also um, upciministers.com. But we have a tremendous amount of resources, video, text, uh, books for sale, digital, hard copy, um, we have programs like the, the Music Ministry, which provides a monthly, for small monthly subscription, monthly training. So first of all, avail yourself. Uh, look at all of our educational programs, all of the various um, endorsed entities that I mentioned. And uh, you'll find an incredible amount of resources available to you. The second thing I would say is get involved in your section, your district, and start getting involved in national and general events like North American Youth Congress, like General Conference. And, uh, when training programs come to you or special meetings come in your area, take advantage as, as much as you can. 
Uh, and then, of course, on the local church level, whatever size you are, there are some principles that will facilitate growth. Um, and so I've written a book called Growing a Church, which talks about it. And I use the experience of our church in Austin, of how we started from our home through multiple building programs to grow to about 1,000. So I can give you principles that will work. And then I've also written a book called Spiritual Leadership in the 21st Century, because the key is going to be to train a small leadership team that has this understanding of the culture of growth. And then they can help the senior pastor to, to uh, apply that. So those two resources, if somebody wants practical training, uh, my book, Growing a Church, my book, Spiritual Leadership in the 21st Century, that will help the local church to transform its own environment uh, to a growth environment. That plus the resources that are available, I think every church can fulfill the mission for which God has called it to, to, to fulfill. And we don't compare with other churches. Different areas will have different um, needs and expectations. And we're not trying to see which one can grow faster than the other. But if we can each be faithful to our calling, I believe God will help us uh, to succeed in the mission that he's called us to fulfill. Absolutely. Thank you very much for taking time to join us on this broadcast today, Dr. Bernard. We very much appreciate it. You mentioned resources that are available. We do want to share one with all of our viewers today. The Urshan Graduate School of Theology does have a professional development seminar that is happening at General Conference. This will be held on Wednesday, September 25th, and on Friday, September 27th. It will be from 2.30 in the afternoon till 6.30 p.m. on both of those days. It's at the Weston Hotel. It's an eight-hour seminar that is designed to equip students with an orientation to current challenges facing the church as well as how to address those challenges. So you will want to visit UGST's website, that is ugst.edu, and there is a link where you can learn more about that seminar right there on the homepage. Thank you so much for joining us today. We certainly appreciate your time and definitely ask your prayers for the United Pentecostal Church going forward. We look forward to great reports again when we get together next time. God bless you.